Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Remember, we're in the, <coughs> the, excuse me, the 15th chapter of the great book of Revelation. What did we find in verse 3? That those that overcame had conquered the mark of the beast, the num understood the number of his name, 666, which is six seal, six trump, six vial, had all that information tucked away, were singing the song of Moses. So where is the song of Moses written? Well, as we discovered in the last uh, lecture, Deuteronomy chapter 32. And we're about halfway through that song of Moses where God has said, I'm going to, in the end times, I'm going to let the real truth fall down as dew in the morning. And I'm going to guard mine elect, Jacob, as the pupil of my eye, which is to say the apple of my eye. And then as an eagle, he said, I'll watch over them. But he said, there will be some that will turn like old Jeshua, and that's fat, dumb, and happy. That is to say, good time Charlie. When the good times flow, they forget about God. And, uh, and he continued on, they'll go astray. But he said, there will be a time that two can put 10,000 to flight. Why, if, you, if you, you and God make a majority, and our Father rules and reigns, but he comes down to the fact where he calls himself our rock. Do you want to stand on something real solid? Then you stand on Christ. Their rock is not our rock. His name is Tyrus, as it is written in Ezekiel uh, 28, which Tyrus in the Hebrew tongue means stone or rock. And their vine is not our vine. The, this vine is the one they harvest in, in um, the great book of Revelation, chapter 14, that the blood ran from the grape clear up to the horse's bridle. It's the vine of the wicked. You don't have anything to worry about. Why? God's not angry at you. So let's pick it up if we may. Deuteronomy 32, verse 32, and it reads, speaking of God's enemies, the Kenites, <clears throat> for their vine is of the vine of Sodom. You're going to find that there. And of the fields of Gomorrah, you're going to find perversion, death, sickness, that burning fever that we read of back up in verse 24 when your immune system plays out on you. Uh, their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. In other words, everything about it is bitter. Anything they've got to offer to you is nothing but failure. Verse 33 their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel vimen of asp. All it will do is take you down Primrose Lane. There's, you know, it is, it is so wonderful that Christ's blood lets us rise above all this. You do that simply by standing on the proper rock, the true rock. Verse 34, is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? God said, you think I won't do this? I'm patient. I'm waiting, but I'm going to do it. Verse 35, and here comes the vengeance. Listen to it carefully. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and all the things that shall come upon them make haste. And it's going to close in on them in a hurry. Do you, do you remember in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2, where Christ went into the, to the church and he picked up the scroll of Isaiah and he read, this is the day of salvation, and he laid the scroll down. He didn't finish the sentence because the sentence continues, this is the day of salvation and the day of vengeance shall come. 
In other words, there's a time gap there, a great time gap, because the day of vengeance doesn't come until the second advent. The first advent was for teaching salvation, and so he did. But that day of vengeance is coming, and you can read of it there. Is uh, Everybody has been warned. And if you don't take the warning, that's your problem. Okay, Strictly your business, it's your ship, you sail it, and... If you want the calamity to fall on you, hey, have to it. Have a good trip. Or you can love him and be blessed even today. Verse 36. For the Lord shall judge his people. He is the judge. And repent himself for his servants. In other words, for the elect. He'll take care of them. When he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up, or left, he always takes care of them, verse 37, and he shall say, where are their gods? Their rock, lowercase, not our rock, uppercase, in whom they trusted. In other words, they're praying and calling out to me now, let the misfits heal them. Let their stone god, let their vine heal them of Sodom and Gomorrah and see what happens. Sodom and Gomorrah does not bring a healing, but a burning fever, and so it is. <clears throat> Verse 30, and, and uh, in other words, as long as you stay true to our Father, He will protect you. When you cease being true to Him, you're kind of on your own. Verse 38 which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings, you tithe to them. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. Don't come to me. You got into that flyaway doctrine stuff. You rolled their little east ester eggs and you hopped like a bunny, not biblical, and tried to put it to the day of Passover which as you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7, Christ became our Passover. Make sure you're somewhere celebrating Passover, where Christ is our Passover, not Ishtar. Let them help you is what he's saying. Verse 39, See now that I, emphatic, even I, two times for emphasis, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. In other words, he's, 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 he's it. He's still on the throne. He knows how to take care of his own. That's why you can take great comfort in knowing that he loves you. All he requires is that you love him in return, that you're loyal to him. He's jealous. Don't go messing around with other religions. Don't go messing around with uh, false doctrines. It won't do you any good. Well, how, how can I tell the difference, whether it's written in God's word or not? It, that is so simple, a child can understand that. Verse 40. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. I, I'm, I live forever. My word is the, was the same yesterday it is today, and it shall be forever. You can count on it. That's why you never waste your time studying God's word, because you're going to have it with you for an eternity. He never changes. And we thank our Father for that fact. And uh, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Verse 41, if I whet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. You're going to get everything you got coming to you. Now, if you've served the Lord and if you love him, his love is going to be returned to you with many blessings. But the enemy... You, you want to stay uh, out of that position and that way of belief because they're going to get it. Everything they've got coming, they're going to get their reward, and it's certainly not like yours. You get everything you've got coming to you all at one time. 
Now, Christians have a way of putting themselves on guilt trips. I, and we do fall short. But once you repent, it's erased. It's gone. It's not there. Forget it. God says, don't remind me of it ever. It's gone. So you have nothing but reward there when you love him, follow him, and stay under his wing. Whereby That is to say, under his command. Then you're in fantastic shape. But, and you have nothing to worry about. Understand, this vengeance goes toward the enemy, not the ones he loves. Verse 42, I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives for the beginnings of revenges upon the enemy. Uh, from the... Uh, from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. At the head leaders, I'm going to start at the top and work my way down. And, and so it is. It's just like judgment begins at the pulpit. So, uh, you know, if, if you run a pulpit teaching God's word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, the real truth, you'll have reward. If you didn't, then you, you get the, that glittering sword first. Verse 43, Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. And, and that ends the Song of Moses. That, what a beautiful psalm put, song put in by our Father, written 14 hundred years B.C. And that was a long time ago. And, and when it was written 1,400 years, it's right down to the fact the words that would come from the mouth at the second advent of God's elect that have overcome the, the Satan system. So that makes those words very important to you. It's God's promise to you. Within it, he promised you that the truth will come. He sent you the letter to document it, plus the action of the Holy Spirit in your mind and your life, and how that the false vine, the vine of Satan, will try to ensnare you. It'll try to grow roots right around you. You pull those roots up, throw them away, keep your... Keep your spiritual life well weeded where no falsehood can grow there in your garden of truth. And know that God will always bless you for that. And that's why that song is so precious. Emphatically, God states, I'm going to do it. You can count on it. And there's no, there's really, you can talk gods all you want to, but there's really no God but me. And, and so it is. Uh, so we'll return then to chapter 15 of the great book of uh, Revelation, the unveiling. And we'll pick it up in verse 4, which he has just stated, the overcomers, those that are, if you like, going to heaven or singing that song and the song of the Lamb, which we find in the Psalms. We covered it in the last Passover, Passover before last, I should say. And verse 4 of that 15th chapter reads, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? When at his appearance, you can rest assured, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. It's going to happen. And the first day of the millennium, every knee is going to bow to him. Right, because they'll see his presence. They'll know they've been had. The sad part is, is there's many churchmen that mean well but find out they weren't taught. And they, they, when Satan came along with his flyaway doctrine, they jumped on his wagon. You don't want to go there, friend. That's shame. Verse 5. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Do you know when it was really opened? The temple of the testimony. It was really opened if you are a believer. 
a seeker of truth, a hunter of every drop of truth. You know when that tabernacle of testimony was opened. It was opened when the Holy of Holies, the veil was rent from top to bottom when Christ had finished his mission on, on earth as the walking word in the flesh and reascended back to Almighty God and sit at the right hand of God. He opened up the Holy of Holies where it wasn't just a priest that could go in and receive the testimony, but anyone that wants to hear the word of God, you can go in. You don't need some representative. You can talk to him, and he hears you. He wants you to talk to him. That testimony wide open, saying, come on in. And you can enter boldly when you love him and uh, let him know in return that you love him. And he will certainly return that love. What a precious thing that he opened. You know, that's kind of one of the names of the book of Revelation, the unveiling and the opening of the very truth itself, kind of the center of it. Absorb it. Enjoy it. Verse 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breast girded with golden girdles. They're all set here, and these, um, what do they have? Verse 7, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. There's no getting around it, um, <clears throat> and so it is. Now, I, I'm, um, Fiale uh, is what this vial is, and I'm, you know, a lot of people picture this as some little perfume bottle or something of that nature. Uh-uh. Fiale is a wide mouth flat dish, and when it's poured out, it doesn't sprinkle. It comes with a splash. It is, God's wrath is dumped from a wide mouth container. And when he's ready, a lot of people think, well, ah, it's the same as it's ever been. Don't worry. Things are going to change. So this is what they were handed. God insists that that wrath be poured out. This is the cup that Jesus himself was praying could be passed. Is there any other way, God, we can do this? Because it's not going to be a pleasant thing for some people. But do you know something? I believe with all my heart because we have the millennium immediately following this, that it is a blessing to those people that receive that to know they still, if they had no opportunity, even if they're worshiping Satan, if they did it in ignorance, once the correction takes place, they have an opportunity to reign for when we, uh, to rather to study and show themselves approved and many are going to say, is that a second chance? And not, not, not on your life. They don't have a prayer of a chance coming out the gate with what they're being taught. They're, they're lined up to worship the Antichrist because he claims to be Jesus, and they don't know any better. They don't think they have to face the false Jesus. Why? Because some preacher, ratchet jaw, has told them they're going to be gone. And I say that respectfully, of course. And, um, but... It's not their fault, is what I'm saying. That's why judgment begins at the pulpit. And, and um, our Heavenly Father, He loves His children, and that correction, that's tough love. But tough love saves a lot of souls. And I think God's love is even in that, though some might think it sounds very bitter. Hey, He's warned and warned. He has rewarned. You go and break the law, and you're going to get the wrath, okay? But what are you going to do after that? That's up to you. If you had no opportunity, then as it is written again, I will repeat Revelation 20, verse 5, God's elect will reign, that means teach, for a thousand years before Satan is released a short season. We'll see if they make it then. Next verse, please. Verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. 
and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. In other words, heaven was closed for that period of time. And, and, and so it is. Why? Well, now, just remember, Christ is right here on earth at that time. When those plagues, the, the final parts of them. And that's why hell, heaven is closed at that time, because the testing is about to take place. And so it is. There you have that beautiful 15th chapter, which is written to heaven. Chapter 14 was written to earth. But with even that 15th chapter being written to heaven, he inserts that beautiful Song of Moses, which definitely has to do with his people here on earth and their reaction and interaction with him as it should be when he pours his blessings out on this nation. Now, we'll then move right, moving right on then to chapter 16 in this great book of uh, Revelation. 16 verse 1, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. That leaves no doubt as to where the wrath's going. Not going to heaven. It's going right here to earth. Verse 2, And the first went and poured out his vial. He dumped it spot upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous, grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. That um, sore is an ulcer. It's that burning fever that we read of in the Song of Moses. Men that disregard the word of God and go counter to everything God ever taught. And certainly they end up with it, and deservedly so. Verse 3, and the second poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. It's, it's a little bit difficult for you to understand if you don't understand what the sea is here. And we're speaking spiritually. I want you to look at chapter 17. Look ahead, chapter 17, verse 15. I want you to know what the sea is what the water is. It's important. It's the same water that the great harlot rides upon. God interprets this for you, so don't you mess with it. It needs no further interpretation. Listen to it. Verse 15 of chapter 17. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So, in other words, the waters, or the sea, are the people that he poured that uh, cup of wrath out upon. And I assure you that um, it, would, uh, it was turned to blood, I guess. Now, back back up, if you would, to chapter 11, so that you know God, God makes these things real clear that you can understand what did the two witnesses do when they appeared on earth? Chapter 11, verse 6. These, speaking of the two witnesses, have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters. Don't forget what waters are. To turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And so it is. So we see that the God's elect have that trump card way before the fact because the witnesses come in 1,290 days, whereas Satan only has 42 months, 42 moons. A moon is only 29 and a half days, let's say. That's about 10 days short overall meaning the two witnesses are here before the false Christ comes to direct for the Holy Spirit to come through through the great lights of the seven-stem menorah 
candles that will light the world at that time when they are delivered up. So you see, the waters being the people, when the truth is poured out on them, that wrath of God, there'll be a lot of people waking up at that time and to their astonishment, they considered themselves to be Christian, to love the Lord and worship the first supernatural entity that appeared on earth claiming to be Jesus because he could do lightning come from heaven right in front of them, great miracles, greatest revival I've ever seen in my life. And I believed it. Why would you be so stupid when God warned you in chapter 13 it was going to happen? How could you be so stupid or, or forgetful when he warned you in Luke uh, 21, in Mark 13, and in Matthew 24, exactly all seven things that would transpire, detail by detail by detail. And, and when, when it finally happens, you're shocked and surprised. Well, I sit on that church pew and the preacher didn't say anything. Did you read God's Word with understanding? That's why he sent the letter to you. I'm not talking down to anyone and I'm not scolding anyone, but I love the brethren and I don't want you to see it. I want you to study God's Word to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the Word of God where God can use you rather than you have to be abused, misled, used by Satan because of ignorance. <clears throat> Our Father is so very good to us. Let's go with the next verse in chapter 16, 4. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Here even the third poured, I mean the people getting it one right after the other. Boom, boom, boom. Do you know something? There'll be a lot of them still wrestling with it. They won't even know what's happening. They'll just consider it hard times, things going bad. Why doesn't God help us? He sent you a letter telling you exactly what you should do to, pr to prevent that. It's too bad you didn't read it. It's too bad you didn't study it so that you would know and be prepared and be under his wing where those things would have none effect on you whatsoever. But on you, quite the contrary, you would have the almighty blessings of the living God. Verse 5, And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be. He's coming because thou hast judged thus. And God's judgment is always accurate. God's judgment is always fair and, and uh, equitable, and you can count on it. That's why when you do what's right, even though you mess up occasionally and repent, you're in good shape. You can trust him. That's what faith is, is loving him knowing that he cares. You do not want these things to fall upon you. And there's no excuse for it when all you have to do is love him and obey him. Because he is righteous, and what he's doing even with the cup is righteous. Verse 6, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. For they are worthy. Now, who, who is this? Who has shed the blood of saints? Have you never, this is why he sent you this letter. Have you never read in Matthew chapter 23? Matthew chapter 23. Uh, let's just take a moment and let's cover what he's talking about here. He says in Matthew 23 concerning the Kenites, okay. He said um, in verse 31, Matthew 23, Wherefore you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. You did it. Well, well, who is he talking about? Well, let's read it. You fill up the measure of your father's lower case, not our father, 33, who are they? Listen, ye serpents, 
ye generation, the word in the Greek is offspring, you offspring of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? They can't, unless they were totally to repent and become children of God. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all, how much? All the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barcarias, which ye slew between the temple and the altar. Now, from the blood of Abel, let's see, then wh what is this generation of serpents? Well, who slew Abel? Well, Cain did. Why? Because he was a generation of viper, of the viper, of the head snake, Satan. He said, you're guilty of it coming out the gate. And don't worry, God is certainly aware of it. And when, when they destroy those that God sent, God makes great mark of it, and this is where they get their comeuppance. If the tares do not change, their, their um, gift is certainly in the cup, and they will enjoy it to the fullest degree, because God is a God of vengeance. He's jealous and his wrath is ready, especially for those that led his children astray, those that would take advantage of a situation, and certainly the Kenites have. This is why our Father's word is so important and yet at the same time so very simple if you ferret out, if you winnow it in the harvest of truth and absorb it as you harvest that truth from God's word, that each piece falls in place, bringing the simplicity of Christ's teachings into the very buds of your mind, whereby you're not deceived. It's ever so important. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel, one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you've got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. Father, Father's the judge. We don't need to judge. You do have the right to discern spiritually who you should study with, who you should fellowship with, and so forth. A blessed gift from God is spiritual discernment. Always it will keep you out of trouble. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Always, again, a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need a number, don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He's your father. He's the closest relative you will ever have. He's the creator of your very being. And do you know why he created you? Because he loves you. He created you for his pleasure. If you're not giving him any pleasure, then you're failing. And you're a disappointment to him. You're not going to get any blessings from him when you disappoint him. And the main thing he wants from you is your love. 
That doesn't cost you anything if it's, as, if it's real and genuine. Share it with him, for he indeed loves you. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Pauline from Oklahoma. When God was speaking about Jesus, he said, and he will be called Emmanuel. I don't understand why we call him Jesus instead of Emmanuel. When did it change and why? But you, you have, um, Christ has different roles. He has Emmanuel, that is to say God with us. That is to document the point that God saw fit that if he asked man to be born in the flesh, he didn't feel he was too good for that. For coming out the gate in the beginning, he said, let us create man in our image. He included himself. Therefore, he had to call him Emmanuel. But then what was his purpose? You see, that's where Jesus comes in, is his purpose. Translating Jesus from English back to the Hebrew, Yeshua. You have the full meaning rather than a, tra than, um, the, rather than a, a partial uh, translation. You have the full translation. You have Yahweh's Savior. In other words, our Father's sacred name, Yahweh, sent a Savior. That's what Jesus means. He is the Savior. Now, he has another name. Let's don't overlook it. Christ, which is to say Christos, which means what? The anointed one. This is why Christians should always anoint with the oil of our people because that's what, must, that's what Christ means, is the anointed one. The etymology of the word even comes from rubbing as in anointing because he is the anointed one. And so there you have it. There's naturally his true name for God's elect is Yeshua. Well, why do you use Jesus then? Because I'm a teacher. I use all the names to teach people that only speak one language to learn another. And therefore working them into the very sacred name. Alice from Pennsylvania, you teach that other people besides Noah and his family were on the ark, but in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 30, it says eight souls were saved. Didn't the others have a soul? Yes, they did, but they were not Adamic. There was only eight Adamic souls. That was the subject, the daughter, sons of Adam, that they should be saved, the pure genealogy through which Christ would come. If when you go back to Genesis chapter 6, Noah's family was the only family that had a perfect generation, which meant pedigree. That upset some people, but that's what the Hebrew word means. Meaning what? They had not intermixed with the fallen angels, whereby there were no hybrids in Noah's family, in his daughter-in-laws, or his sons, or his wife, or himself. Jerry from Colorado, question. The fallen angels that came down in Noah's time, how did they get loose to come to earth? I thought God was holding them in heaven. Thank you for teaching and help and uh, keep up the good work. Well, we're, we're going to do it, uh, Jerry. Uh, there, you know, again, God gives us free will. And you can read in the great book of Jude, a little short book right before the great book of Revelation we're studying. In the first six verses, their sin was that they left their place of habitation. Why? They, they, were, they were infatuated with women. And, and rather than waiting to be born to woman, they came to earth disobeying God. It cost them their eternal soul. Period. They, there's no judgment for them. They've already been judged. They left their place of habitation, which went counter to God's plan, planned by Satan, no doubt, whereby they impregnated many women and Geber were born, hybrids. That was destroying God's plan of salvation. Therefore, he had to bring about the flood of during Noah's time to destroy the hybrids. And 
and uh, the only family that was perfect through which Christ could come. Melba from Missouri, where can I find proof that Cain was not Adam's son? Lots of places, lots of places. Uh, one of the main places you can find it is in the genealogy. You know, you, know, you understand what a genealogy is? It kind of lets you know who's, who's, who's pappy, okay? And who the children are and so forth. Um, let's take Adam as an example, and let's look at his offspring, the children he sired. Cain's not there. Well, wonder why? Because he wasn't his father. That's why, it's real simple. God doesn't mess up. The genealogy is perfect and true. Cain has his own genealogy. You want to know who his father is? Then Jesus told you in St. John chapter 8, verse 44. He said, you, this, the viper people, Kenites, which Kenite is a Hebrew word that simply means children of Cain. That's their genealogy. He said, you don't do what I tell you to do because you are of your father, the devil. It makes it pretty plain. If Jesus said it, and then you'll, you'll have some nitwit that'll come along and say, well, he's just speaking spiritually. The word seed is sperma. Don't be fooled. Keith from Tennessee. How do you define the Antichrist from Satan, and what is the difference in Michael and Gabriel's authority? They do what God tells them to do. Michael is, is basically t is in charge of taking care of Satan. And naturally, Gabriel's going to help him wherever he has to or whatever God tells him to do. That's why they are archangels and will always be. They'll never be born to woman. How do you define the Antichrist from Satan? He is the son of perdition. Have you ever, do you remember we just finished the 12th chapter where it said that old dragon, which is the devil, which is Satan, which is the serpent? Those are all roles that Satan played since the beginning of time. Um, and that's, that's why he deceives so many people. We probably will be doing the book of Daniel following this, and you're going to learn a lot of names of Satan before we finish that book, if, if, we, if God allows us to go there. Rob from Kentucky. Thank you and your staff for all you think you're so welcome. My question is, if someone has the seal of God in their forehead, are they definitely one of God's elect? Can't miss. They sure can't miss. They are God's elect. Uh, Yolanda from South Carolina. When God says, touch not those that have the seal of God in their forehead, why are the elect brought up? Is it the witness to Satan only? No, they witness before Satan, but the, tr the trials, he's coming as Savior. That's why he calls himself Antichrist, which he is, he will be calling himself Christ. He will be calling himself Jesus. The world won't know the difference because they, if they haven't been taught, you will. But these trials, as it is written in Mark 13, will, will go around the world. And that's no, that's no big step for a stepper. I mean, this signal you're hearing right now goes around the world in nanoseconds. Boom. Just like that, praise God. But um, these trials are not, it's, it is standing before death, which is to say the devil. But the trials go out to the world so that the world can hear the Holy Spirit speak through you. What a time to live. Is this time that... Uh, just prior, and, and I feel very soon, for that second advent. Gay from, guy from, um, or Gay from Pennsylvania. What happens when we die? Well, you kick the bucket, okay? Now, when, when you die, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. But, Old Testament Ecclesiastes, better yet. Chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, to, be, to the instant this old clay pot breaks and the silver cord part, that means that your very soul leaves this flesh body, instantly it returns to the Father that gave it. Your spirit does, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning your spiritual being. 
you return to the Father. And if you want to, if you want to break that down further than that, you go to Luke chapter 16, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, and it gives you paradise, that's the holding place until the millennium, and it lets you know who's on one side of the, the gulf and who's on the other. Some make it and some don't. If you want to go even further than that and know what they're doing in heaven right now, you would want Goodspeed's Apocrypha, and you would want to go to chapter 7 in the book of Ezra to verse 77, and it tells you what the good side's doing and what the bad side's doing. Um, and um, naturally, um, no other Apocrypha. Well, there's one other, and I'm not even going to mention its name, but Goodspeed is the only Apocrypha we carry it in our library that uh, has that particular chapter in it. It is uh, legal tender. Linda from Georgia, where in the Bible does it talk about both sides of the Gulf? Isn't it amazing how one question follows another? <coughs> Luke 16. Luke 16. It is a parable, but it's about a parable about two men who actually lived on earth. Uh, Charlene from Pennsylvania, I know you don't like the King James Version of the Bible. What Bible do you think would be more useful in our daily living? I love the King James Bible. Whatever gave you that opinion? We handle the King James Version known as the Companion Bible, but it is definitely a King James Bible. I will have no other Bible other than a King James Bible. Uh, why? Because some of the greatest scholars that God has allowed to walk this earth, Dr. Strong and um, Dr. Bullinger, between the two, they put together a King James Bible, and Dr. Bullinger in the Companion Bible pulls in the very Masara itself where it's very important in a side column and a companion column, so that the English reader that cannot understand Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic, because the Masara is in uh, basically Hebrew, then it breaks it down where the English reader can have advantage of that scholarship, plus Dr. Strong's. Uh, don't, don't ever buy a Young's Concordance, don't ever buy the, some off-brand concordance. Dr. Strong is the only concordance you want because it's accurate and it's true if it's the proper version. We carry them here in this, in this uh, library. It allows the English reader to go back into the manuscripts. I am very much against the newer translations. You'll remember in yesterday's lecture I told you in the Song of Moses where it said, I separate and set the bounds of the, the sons of Adam. You see, Adam means ready complected. And the newer versions change that word to men in the English, which it loses. That's only one place. They have also changed. In Ezekiel chapter 13, along with between following verse 18, Instead of saying, as it does in the Hebrew manuscripts, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls, they erase all of that and say, I'm against birds flying. Misses the whole point. Why? Because some Kenite changed it. That's why. Well, you might say, well, are you, are you judging somebody? No, it's a fact. Who else would do it? You know, there are certain evil scholars in new works that if you're a scholar enough, you can almost trace them. And they're up to no good. Beware of late translations that come out of God's holy word. What they're trying to do is pull you away from the scholarship that is proven over time to help you keep God's word in the simplicity in which he wrote it. John from Michigan, I, I, I very much love the, the uh, King James uh, Version, but not the late models. John from Michigan, Pastor Murray, in one of your 
past broadcast, you said that once the heart and lungs go out, that it was God's way of saying they're used and that you don't believe in transplants. No, I didn't say that. I'm 45 years old and I need a transplant or I will die. I would like your uh, advice on this, please. No, no. You see, you're putting words in my mouth. I said, I think it's a beautiful thing for people to give their bodies to science. That's what, uh, to give somebody sight that has no sight, if the pupil of your eye will bring vision to somebody, you sure don't need it anymore. You've got a perfect all-seeing body. <clears throat> and likewise, uh, kidneys and other uh, parts of the body that are needed, is, that's, that's a wonderful thing. All I said was, I personally, and there's nothing wrong with this if somebody wants to, and I always say that, but when it comes to getting a lung, heart, and, and a kidney, all of those things at one time, I, I personally myself wouldn't want that. I would rather go on back to the Father because you would be put on and this is only my personal opinion. You would have to be on so many antibodies to keep you from rejecting any of those things because surely one or the other would be rejected if you didn't, that your quality of life wouldn't be all that much. But that's just my own personal opinion. There's certainly no sin in it. Go for it. Uh, Beverly from Georgia. When did Satan and the angels rebel? Well, Satan and the angels originally rebelled a long time ago in the first earth age. Uh, Almighty God lets you know about this in Ezekiel chapter 28. You begin reading about verse 12 where he says, you, uh, and a little earlier, I made you the full pattern. Man, I made you something to look at. Why, well, he earned it. He elevated him all the way up to the cherub because he was a cherubim. Uh, to the office of protecting the mercy seat. But where he fell and rebelled was he decided rather than protecting the mercy seat, he was going to sit on it. He was going to rule. This is why still to this day he, he, does, he wants Christ's seat. And that's why he comes as Antichrist. Okay? Uh, that, that was in the first earth age. It was God's catable overthrow that destroyed all that and brought us into this dispensation of time. Richard from Arizona, are Cain and Abel twins? The answer is yes, they are. Documentation you find in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 2, because you will find the first pregnancy took place in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 between the serpent seed and the woman's seed. In chapter 4, verse 1, the second pregnancy of twins took place with Adam and Eve. And the reason you know that, you see, you have fraternal twins and you have identical twins. Identical twins are in the same bag of water, meaning they, they are a pregnancy that took place at the same time. Identical twins can even be by separate fathers, I'm sorry. Fraternal twins, not identical. Fraternal twins can, can be pregnancies even by separate fathers because there are two eggs and there are two bags of water. This is as it was with Cain and Abel. The reason you know they were twins you find in Hebrews, Genesis rather, chapter 4, verse 2. The word again is sokach in the Hebrew, and it means she continued in labor after giving birth to Cain. Well, what does that mean? She had another baby, which means they were twins. They came of age at the same time to offer offerings to God, documentation. Willie and Jackie from Mississippi, how do you pay your tithes and who do you pay your tithes to if you don't have a church to go to regularly? You tithe where you're fed to keep the food coming. Okay, that's just it's just that simple. You always tithe where you're fed. If you're fed in more places than one, you split it even. Nothing wrong with that. But tithe is a very personal thing. And each person must always make their own mind up about that and and that's the end of story. Shirley from Tennessee. 
Where in the scriptures is the saying, ashes to ashes and dust to dust? There, there is no saying such as that. Um, I know many pastors quote that scripture at a funeral, but it is only dust to dust. Just drop the ashes out, okay? And they're quoting Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and you've heard me quote it earlier. Um, it's verse 6 and 7. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, dust to dust from which it came. Um, but there is nothing wrong with cremation if a person wishes these bodies are going back to the dirt from which they came. How they get there, it does not matter because you have another body that's far more beautiful. That is to say, beautiful in the sense that God created it whereby it doesn't age, it doesn't get old, it doesn't wrinkle, it doesn't get diseased, and time means nothing to it. Uh, so you don't want this flesh thing anymore. It's fini. Wellina from Michigan. And I, is Satan in heaven or on earth? He's in heaven helped by Michael. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 and 8. Hey, I'm out of time again. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it. it makes his day when you read the letter he sent you. And when you make his day, Boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. Now, we, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, well, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, when, when you bless God, he always blesses you. You know why? Because he loves you. You're his, you're his child, and he's your father. And indeed, he proves that love when you study his letter. Most important, hey, you stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel.
Welcome to the Temple Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to finish the lecture on guilt trip. And, uh, you know, I suppose that Satan utilizes that method of making Christians feel bad more than anything else. I mean, he, example, what did Satan tempt Christ with in Matthew chapter 4? 